You know, we all go through the crummy times sometimes. Sometimes those get really bad. But sometimes, um, obviously, we need help. But sometimes there's something that we could do that's actually going to help. And so I was thinking about this, and I came up with 10 tips um, to probably help you if you're feeling crummy, you're in a bad spot. Now, let me start by saying um, there are certainly things that we can change and do that help. Um, but sometimes we need more than that. So this isn't to be confused with going and getting real professional help if you need that. That's not what this is. I'm just giving you some helpful tips and principles. But if you're stuck in it and things are really bad, get some professional help. And also, don't do any of these if it's too much or would be hurtful or dangerous or injurious to you. Because these are general principles that generally, it's sort of like saying, you know, Eat your vegetables. <laughs> These things help. But some people are allergic to certain vegetables, so you have to be careful. But anyway, let's hop into this. These are questions I want you to ask yourself, a little self-diagnosis here. Um, first of all, ask yourself, are you kind of isolated in a kind of circle of malaise? Who knows about what you're going through? And secondly, who knows about what you're going through that you're actually talking to that actually brings something to the party? You know, a lot of times they're talking to people, but they're adding to the problem more than helping. And so ask yourself, are you connected to some kind of support, some kind of understanding, some kind of empathy, um, some kind of input? If you're going through a hard time and you're isolated, that's number one. Number one is to call a friend, you know, Call a therapist. Call, talk to somebody. Don't stay isolated with secret pain. We're only as sick as our secrets. You might have heard that. So somebody needs to be in it with you. Okay. Are you connected? Number two, are you focusing in a lot of the misery, focusing on things outside of your control? You know, this is like the first part of the serenity prayer. You know, God help me change the things I can and, and you know, not worry about the things I can't, the courage to change the things I can and surrender the things I can't, let go of the things I can't. I don't have control of those things and the wisdom to know the difference. So this is kind of the, the audit to put those in those categories. Sometimes what's making us miserable is we're in a continual obsessive loop on stuff that we have no control of. And so it's much better to ask yourself, what can I control? And these 10 things are things you can control that could actually change this. Or in this problem, what do I actually have control of that I can move the needle? And then surrender the rest of it. I remember my, um, my dad had a breakdown when he was 41 or so. Um, his health had gone bad. He was really stressed. He had built a business and was doing too much and gained a bunch of weight and high blood pressure and all that. He collapsed in a theater. And they took him to the doctor, and he stayed there for a little bit, and they told him he had six months to live, literally. Well, they didn't like that diagnosis. Um, they said his heart wasn't going to last. So then he went to another city, went to another hospital, big teaching hospital um, in the South, and kept him there for quite a while. And at the end of it, they said, there's nothing wrong with you except stress. You got to change your ways. You got to change your lifestyle and your habits. Well, he did a number of things, but one of the things he did was he started every day uh, he would in he would end work at five o'clock. He went in early and ended at five. And he said he started to practice every day. When he got finished, he would take all the problems on his desk and he would say, "God, these are your problems until tomorrow morning. I'm surrendering all of them to you." And he put them out of his head and he'd go home. So, some things you can't control. And some of those things on your desk, you can't even pick up at six tomorrow morning because they are really outside of your control. Let's turn those over. Let's surrender those. You can't do anything about them anyway. Hey, Finley, I can't do anything about my dog barking right now because I'm here by myself. 
somebody's at the door that she's going to take in front of if um, they're not nice. Okay. <laughs> the third one, um, are you needing to set any boundaries that might end the crummy situation? Maybe there's somebody you need to stop talking to. They're just feeding you with a bunch of sludge, sewage water. Set some boundaries on a crummy situation, perhaps, that you could do and say no to that stuff. Are you overextended and need to set some boundaries and say no to just you're burned out, you're wiped out? Is there a situation that requires some setting some limits on this? That's a big one. The next one. Are you needing to process some real grief that and pain that you're just kind of sitting on and not really talking about? Now, the first one is about being isolated, but this one is about you might not even be isolated, but you're not really talking about what is hurting you or processing some kind of pain. That's a big deal. You know, pain kind of sits like an infection and it just grows inside if we're not getting it out. So are you needing to process something? The next one, are you thinking in catastrophic ways? You know, this is what the cognitive people talk about, that stuff happens and we'll, we'll just tell ourselves the worst thing about whatever the thing is. This is awful. It's going to be the end of my life. I'll never have another friend again. We, you know, you're dating somebody who just broke up. Oh, I'll never date again. Nobody will ever like me. There's no good ones out there. All this kind of catastrophic noise that comes from stinking thinking. Well, do a little audit of that. Are you thinking in ways that really are not true, but your brain's telling you they are? And secondly, they're really not helping. One of the things I learned a lot of, a long time ago is ask myself if I'm thinking some way about something and that's making me worse or not helping or ruminating or catastrophizing, that's not getting me any benefit. So I'm not going to think that way. Just going to change it. Yeah, it's crummy, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I might, you know, that person, they're upset and I can't do anything about it. And they may never talk to me again. And that'll be really sad, but it won't be the end of the world. I have friends or whatever it is. Are you catastrophizing a situation? Maybe with a family member, or a kid or friends or your job or Whatever it is, you know, many times the things we tell ourselves awful things about are really the closing of a door that opens up a new one and a new path or a new relationship that's better than anything you could have imagined. So it's not always true when we're catastrophizing. So look at that. The next one, are you being body wise? Now, how we feel is not just in your head, as some cognitive people would want to tell you. It's all caused by your thinking. Some of it is. Some of it's not. Some of it's caused by emotional stuff that doesn't come from thinking that might be hidden in our you know, hearts and souls. But some of it actually comes from your stinking body. You can change your mood when your blood sugar levels go up and down. You can change how you feel by your thyroid levels changing. You can change how you feel because of hormonal stuff that happens. So there's some body-wise stuff. And you may have to ask yourself, maybe I need to go get a physical. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about basic, are you taking care of your body, your head and your heart and your soul? It lives in a house. And so if the trash isn't getting taken out of the house, then that stuff's not going to be well either. So, I mean, this is not rocket science, but when's the last time you got eight hours of sleep for multiple nights in a row? I mean, unless you got a newborn, come on. Unless you're an ER doc, and then they even put them in shifts, days on and days off. So how are you sleeping? Stop binging or scrolling or... Stand up for three more episodes or whatever it is when your body needs to rest. Are you exercising? You got to move. All sorts of research shows that changes mood. All sorts of research shows us, shows us that. Um, what about too much of a good thing? Maybe you're, uh, you're not having the recommended 
number of glasses of wine per week. <laughs> You're exceeding the number of bottles of wine per week or whatever it is. Are you, is there any substance that's contributing to this? You know, alcohol is a depressant, right? And um, people that smoke a lot of weed get a motivational syndrome a lot of times. I mean, there can be a substance issue, even though you're not an addict and you're functional, might not be good for your body, what you're doing. So are you body-wise? And then the next one, are you practicing just good old stress relief habits that people do? Do you have a hobby? Do you go for walks? Do you play with your dog? Do you have some time of prayer meditation? Do you do relaxation exercises? Are you stretching? Mindfulness practices. Go get a massage. Go, you know, to the weight room. Things that relieve stress. Those are good to do. Those are really, really good to do. And find something that works for you. Okay, here's a real big one. Do you need a break? You've been going too long, too long? It, it, you know, we get in this mode of just going, 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 going. Do you have a Sabbath? You know, the designer of life built into your system rhythms every six days of work. You should have one of rest where you don't do any work. Doesn't have to be on Sunday, doesn't have to be on Saturday, but it should fall somewhere. That's the way your bodies are built. And you should have. You know, when the week's add up, time off. Are you doing that? Some people don't. It's just around the clock. You can't run a car at redlining the RPMs forever. It's going to break down. And then I love this one. It's been one of the most helpful things to me in my life because we all are going to go through hard times. And what I mean by hard times is, you know what happens yeah, you know what? It happens. Well, that can feel awful. But are you putting that in a larger narrative? Are you putting it in a larger narrative? Think of a Netflix movie, and you're in the middle of a rom-com. I don't watch rom-coms, but every now and then I have to because I live in a house, or well, my girls are out of the house now, but lived in a house with three women and a female dog. And every now and then I get roped into watching one of these rom-coms. Well, <clears throat> not to, you know, be a script writer here, but <laughs> and pretty much there's an arc to these things. And, you know, there's usually somebody's kind of in a neutral or a bad time. They're coming out of something and then they meet him or they meet her. And it's kind of goofy there for a minute. And then they start to fall in love and they've found the one and it starts to go up and to the right and it's looking really good. And then he's in the bathroom and left his phone there and text goes off and she looks down and sees it's his ex-girlfriend texting him. And she can't believe it. And while he's still there, she runs and she gets her stuff and she leaves and she gets on a plane and she goes back to Kansas. And all it's all lost. And he comes back and he doesn't know what happened. And, and he's talking to his friends and she won't answer his texts. And, and he's trying to explain and it's terrible. And, and it's over. And oh, no. Well, if you hit pause, that's a frame. There's the rest of the movie. And it ends up in a way different place because that text from the girlfriend, actually she was mad because he wouldn't respond to any of her texts because he said, I found someone new and we're done. Well, that was a scene. And sometimes our bad scenes are really bad scenes, but it will get better and things do get worked out. If they don't get worked out, we resolve them. And, and our lives are a long movie. I had a friend call me, um, it's been about a week and a half, had a teenager that had a 
um, psychotic break. And boy, they were petrified. And he got hospitalized and and he wasn't getting the medication. And it was just, I mean, you can imagine how she felt. It was terrible. And so I'm trying to give her some some help on, you know, we got to find out. I don't like this diagnosis. From what I hear, I don't think he's getting the right medicine. We need to find a second opinion and get another doctor to look at this as well. Maybe she knows something we don't know or he knows something we don't know. But I think you need a second opinion. And then there were some other legal issues involved. And But at, all of, at the end of that conversation, I said, here's what I want to remind you of. This is a scene in a movie. I've been through this. I don't know how many of hundreds more, hundreds of times, because I used to run hospitals. And that's what we do. It's a bad scene that first day, but it's just going to get better. It's going to find the right medicine. You know, it's going to stabilize. It's going to look bad for a little bit. But telling her, you've got to remember, we're just in a scene of a longer movie. Well, we're 10 days out from that now, and I talked to her earlier, and um, things have really stabilized, and she's got hope again, and this and the other. So ask yourself, are you seeing this just as a season of a longer year, metaphorically speaking? So there's um, some things to think about just as first aid tips that's probably good things we ought to take like multivitamins every day.